Uh, you should have your order of service, and there are copies of uh, the message from God's Word. Um, you may have noticed that things are a little bit different today, um, because we'll be having the ordination of In Sub Te to the Eldership of the Presbyterian Church of Australia and induction to uh, the charge of Concord North Strathfield. And a thank you to the 9am uh, folk who uh, have uh, stayed uh, to join with us on that. Let's begin our time together with a quote from John chapter 1. The Word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. We have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. From his abundance we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one, who is himself God, is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Let's say together this prayer of thankfulness. Dear God, thank you that Jesus is the King over all your creation. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross in our place, that we can be your people. Please help us to follow Jesus as our King and be obedient to you. Amen. We can be sure of his forgiveness and love. This is from Colossians chapter 2. You were dead because of your sins, and because of your, sin, your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. For he forgave all our sins. He cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Our first song is How Deep the Father's Love for Us. The government rules have changed again, so we are uh, allowed to stand and sing. So please do stand and let us sing together. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond the Kids, tell me why today is special. Can't tell me why today is special. It's called Palm Sunday, and that's the day we remember when Jesus rose into Jerusalem on the donkey. So Palm Sunday, where people cut down palms and put them in the road for the donkey to tread over. There's another reason why today is special. We're ordaining and inducting a new elder. The edict was read on the 7th and the 14th. I have had no objections. The session has resolved to proceed with the ordination and induction, which will take part very short, take place very shortly. We'll welcome in Subtay into the eldership. 
Um, services as usual next Sunday, but because it's Holy Week, special combined service at 9.30 on Friday. Good Friday here, 9.30, special service, combined service. Offerings, if you wish to make an offering, the plate is at the door, or you can do it directly into the bank. I think those are all the intimations, so welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to explain uh, the procedure. Uh, so we have been through uh, all of the right process for uh, session nominating in subtate uh, to the eldership. Uh, no other nominations were received, so without a vote, the session has uh, supported uh, the uh, congregation in adding uh, in sub to uh, the congregation. Uh, I'm going to be calling in sub up to answer seven questions, and uh, it'll be like getting married again. He has to say "I do" seven times. Uh, I'm going to be asking the congregation two questions, and your response will be "We do." Because it's plural. Um, after that, INSUB will be signing what's called the formula. Now, normally uh, we would offer the right hand of fellowship, but because of COVID, we're not really allowed to do that. Um, so you can congratulate INSUB on his ordination as an elder within the Presbyterian Church of Australia and his induction to the session of Concord North Strathfield Presbyterian Church. Uh, after the service. So there's just an outline of uh, what has been happening. Um, I'm going to ask Insub to come up and stand here. And I'm going to come around the other side and I'll ask the whole congregation to stand, please. Do you own and accept the Westminster Confession of Faith as amended by the General Assembly and read in the light of the de declaratory statement contained in the basis of union adopted by this church on the 24th day of July, 1901, as an exhibition of the sense in which you understand the Holy Scriptures and as a confession of your faith. And do you engage firmly and constantly to adhere thereto and to the utmost of your power to assert, maintain and defend the same? Do you own and accept the purity of worship as practised in this church? Do you own the Presbyterian form of government to be founded on the word of God and agreeable thereto? And do you promise that through the grace of God you will firmly and constantly adhere to and to the utmost of your power in your station, assert, maintain and defend the same? Do you adhere to your acceptance of the call of this congregation to exercise among them the office of ruling elder? Do you engage through divine grace to discharge with diligence and faithfulness the various duties of your office, watching over the flock, showing yourself a pattern of good works, and giving a conscientious attendance on the meetings of session, presbytery, and assembly when duly called to do? And last one. All these things you profess and promise through grace, as you shall be answerable at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Two questions for the congregation. Do you, the members and adherents of this congregation, now confirm the election of in sub te to the office of ruling elder in this congregation? Do you promise to render him all due respect and encouragement in the discharge of his office? Congratulations, in sub get you to sign the formula. Reading from John chapter 12. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honour. Martha served and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume, 
made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth a year's wages, it should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor, he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. He did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And all the people heard Jesus' arrival. They flocked to see him and to see also Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priests decided to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. Uh, some of our 9 a.m. people, uh, the rest of the service is the same as 9 a.m., so you may wish to leave at this point. Um, otherwise, you are, of course, welcome to stay. We're at item number eight. And we're going to be praying for Robin Davies, who serves with the Bible translation team in Papua New Guinea. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for Robin Davies, who serves with a Bible translation team in Papua New Guinea. We give you thanks for the printing of the Eura Language New Testament. We thank you that the Eura Church has been faithfully serving you for 20 years, even though they only had small parts of the Bible in their language. We praise you, Lord God, for the joy your people have at reading your holy word in their own language. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our children's trip today Jesus is someone to follow. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into Simon Peter's boat and asked him to push out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and told the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the net again. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full of fish that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, O oh Lord, please leave me. I am too much of a sinner to be around you. Simon Peter, James and John and those helping them were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. Then Jesus said something strange to Simon. He said, don't be afraid, from now on, you will fish for people. Jesus wanted Simon Peter to go with him and tell people about God. So they pulled their boat up on shore, left everything and followed him. Wow! 
Jesus is someone to follow. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus is someone to follow. Please help us to follow the way Jesus lived, loving God and loving others. In Jesus' name, Amen. John 14, 6 John 14, 6 John 14, 6 And Jesus said to him I am the way and the truth and the life No one comes to the Father except through me I am the way and the truth and the life No one comes to the Father except through me John 14, 6 John 14, 6 John 14, 6 Jesus said to him I am the way and the truth and the life No one comes to the Father except through me I am the way and the truth and the life No one comes to the Father except through me Number 12 in our order of service. The quote from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. 
Our passage today is from John chapter 12. We've already read verses 1 to 11. Uh, We continue the reading at verse 12. The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your Holy Spirit guided the human author, that we have a reliable account of the actions and teaching of your Son, our Lord Jesus. We pray that you would speak to us as we look at the various responses of people to your Son. Guide us, Heavenly Father, when our hearts are closed to you. Open them and soften them, that we will be like those who love you and follow you. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't believe in God. Science has freed us from belief in gods and religion. The young man's Christian friends listened carefully to his reasons for rejecting the Christian faith. They understood that he was partly right in what he was saying. For example, some religions used to worship the sun as a god, so they built temples to honour the sun so that he would get up each day and provide them with light and warmth. And they did similar things for other parts of the natural world, like the rain coming at the best time for their crops. But partly right is also mostly wrong. So they patiently explain that in the Christian religion there is no conflict between science and God. For God created the universe. So science is just an exploration of how God's creation works. One of the Christian friends explained, I can work hard to understand how my car works. And then I might say that Because I know a lot about my car's internal combustion engine and the mechanics of my gearbox, that that proves that nobody designed and built the car. But is that really a sensible and logical conclusion? He continued, We all know that our cars are created by teams of designers and engineers. In the same way, we can look at the beauty and complexity of the universe. Is it really sensible to conclude that because we are starting to understand how the mechanics of the universe works, that that proves there isn't a God who created it? Instead, doesn't the beauty of the world suggest to us that there is a good designer behind it? The discussion went on for some time, but eventually the young man said, OK, I understand that there is no conflict between Christianity and science. But I still don't believe in your God. There's too much evil and suffering in the world for there to be a good God behind it. Over the next few months, the young man raised all of the common objections to the Christian faith. Things like, doesn't science disprove the need for religion? What about the problems of suffering and evil in the world? Can we believe in the miracles in the Bible? How do we know Jesus even existed? Can we really believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the grave after three days? How do we know that the Bible is accurate and reliable? While I've laid out this list of common questions about the Christian faith in a simple and clear order, 
The reality of the discussion between this young man and his Christian friends was a lot more chaotic. As with most real human discussions, they moved in and out of several different topics at the same time. But eventually, after more than a year of difficult debate and argument, the young man said that he he had no more objections to belief in Jesus Christ. But then he said to his friends, I'm still not going to become a Christian. I don't want to. I want to continue to live my life my own way. And I don't want to talk about this stuff anymore. Over the last 50 years, Christian churches have put a lot of effort into developing good books, video courses and movies that clearly explain the Christian faith. There are many great resources for answering these common problems that people have with Belief in Jesus Christ. We must always take seriously people's genuine reasons for rejecting the God of the Bible. We should treat people with respect, listen carefully to the problems they have with Christianity. The famous atheist Christopher Hitchens once wrote, There are all kinds of stupid people that annoy me, but what annoys me most is a lazy argument. See, he loved debating intelligent and well-prepared Christians like Dr. John Lennox, even though he admitted that he often lost the debate. But he had no respect for Christians who put no effort into understanding why he rejected all religions. But even with all the evidence clearly and simply laid out to show the truth of Jesus' claims to be the Son of God, some will still resist and reject the call of Christ to come to him in repentance and faith. So Hitchens also wrote, Even if I accepted that Jesus was born of a virgin and rose from the grave after three days, I still would not believe that his teachings are true. In our passage from John 12 today, we find some responses to Christ Jesus that truly shock and disturb us. Why would the religious leaders plan to kill Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead? And how could Judas be a greedy thief when he had seen the power, kindness, and generosity of God at work in Jesus? And we see some responses that warm our hearts and challenge us to remember that God is good and worthy of humble praise and service. The disciples had been fighting among themselves for the top jobs in Jesus' new government in Jerusalem. But now they begin to understand why Christ rode into the capital city on a gentle donkey instead of a powerful war horse. And we watch in wonder as Mary covers Jesus' feet with expensive perfume and wipes them with her own hair. As Jesus said, she did this in preparation for my burial. Lazarus had been dead for four days before Jesus and his disciples arrived at his hometown of Bethany. A large crowd had come from nearby Jerusalem to comfort Lazarus' sisters, Martha and Mary. Jesus ordered them to roll away the large stone that covered the entrance to the cave where his body lay. But they objected. There'd be a terrible smell. Jesus responded, Didn't I tell you that you would see the glory of God if you believe? So they obeyed Jesus' command, opened the tomb, and Christ called Lazarus from the grave, fully restored back to life. God's glory displayed in his control over death. And what was the response of the Jewish leaders to God's power and grace shown in this wonderful miracle? Well, they called the high council together and said, this man certainly performs many uh, miraculous signs. If we allow him to go on like this, soon everyone will believe in him. And the Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. A little later we read, Then the leading priests decided to kill Lazarus too. 
for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. How can these people see the power of God at work in Jesus raising Lazarus from the grave, but still refuse to listen to his message of love and forgiveness? As we listen to their words, we hear what they believed would bring them strength and comfort. They look to the outer trappings of religion, the temple buildings, their leadership of God's people, the nation of Israel. They were comfortable with their little world and wanted to keep it just as it was. Sin and death were everywhere. The Israel suffered under the Roman occupation of their country. But the leaders were comfortable so long as they kept their positions of power and respect in society. But now the common people were deserting them to follow Jesus because of Lazarus being raised from the dead. As Jesus rode gently into Jerusalem on a donkey, a large crowd of Passover visitors came out to meet him. And we read, many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb. And they were telling others about it. And that was the reason so many went out to meet him. What was the religious leader's solution? Kill Lazarus. And arrest Jesus when the crowds weren't watching so that they could have him killed too. Can we see the irony in their solution? to kill Lazarus, whom God, through Jesus, has already once raised from the grave? Obviously, they haven't thought this course of action through. See, Satan's most successful work has always been in the leadership of God's people. Methodist Church in England was founded 200 years ago on the preaching of the gospel, the call of people to repentance and faith in Christ Jesus. And they were clear in their message that salvation and eternal life came only through the work of Christ on the cross. It was the same message of Jesus Christ that Peter preached 2,000 years ago. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name in heaven by which we must be saved, Acts 4.12. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, wrote, Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin, desire nothing but God, and we shall shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. Such great passion brought thousands to repentance from sin and saving faith in our Lord Jesus. But Wesley also warned of the dangers for the future church, saying, The sin that one generation tolerates the next generation will embrace. And now, the Methodist Church preaches that all religions are good paths in man's search for God, whatever God may be. And Jesus was just a good man who died in a failed attempt to create a more peaceful and gentle society. A good example to follow, but not the Son of God who will return in glory. Now we may feel discouraged as we contemplate the poor state of the large number of churches who claim to follow Christ, but instead they preach dangerous messages that lead people away from the truth of the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We need to remember that Jesus was just one man, and through him, God changed the world and the whole course of people's eternal future. Jesus' followers were just a few ordinary people. But the message of Jesus the Christ, the King and Saviour, spread throughout the whole Roman Empire. Within a few years, churches were established in every city and large town. Wesley was a failed missionary to America. But when he came to genuine faith in Christ, he was filled with energy and power as he preached the gospel. Hundreds of thousands came to faith in Christ through his preaching, 
and the ministry of those who followed him. We can see the results of Wesley's warnings about tolerating sin in the church. The bit by bit, the church has let rejection of Jesus Christ and the Bible take control. This is no reason for us to give in to defeat and hide away in our safe little Bible-based churches. Rather, we should follow his example. Fear only sin. Desire only God. And through us, the Lord Jesus can shake the gates of hell, bring the kingdom of God to earth. We can also take great encouragement from the life of Mary. He went from the pleasure of sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his teaching, to the misery of seeing her much-loved brother Lazarus die. She went from the confusion of wondering why Jesus stayed away when he heard that Lazarus was ill, to the joy of seeing her brother raised from the tomb. And now, Jesus is back in her home as he prepares to enter Jerusalem. And Mary's response to his visit is to sit at his feet, bathe them in her most precious gift of perfume, and wipe them with her hair. Now, these are not the actions of a person who is trying to bribe or manipulate Jesus into doing something she wants for herself. Mary is not like Judas, who is only concerned with his own immediate material interests. Judas's ambition could not see beyond a few silver coins in his money bag. But Mary is an example of someone who is filled with sincere love for Christ, is happy to sit at her master's feet in humble adoration and service. Now she is about to face the, the shock of seeing her Lord beaten and crucified. A few days later, the confusing joy of knowing he was raised to life again as the great victor over sin and death. Her life as a friend and follower of Jesus was certainly not smooth and easy. And neither will ours be. But if we are content to remain faithful and dependent on his strength and power, he will lead us along good paths. Good Christian ministries never start in the planning room of a church office. They begin with our Lord's grateful people sitting at his feet. It is only as we listen and learn from a position of humble adoration that we can be fit for his service. There's an old story from the Christian revival that swept through Scotland about 150 years ago. Late one evening, a young man was rowing a small boat across a lake. There was a little church near the edge of the lake, and as he rowed past it, he felt a strong need to go into the church. As he pulled the boat up onto the shore, he heard quiet voices. And as he moved to the church's open door, he saw a group of about 20 people praying. They were asking the Lord to have mercy on the people of their little village and for many to come to hear the gospel at an outreach service they were planning. God responded to their humble, dependent prayers. He didn't wait for their planned ministry to start. He brought that young man to saving faith in Jesus Christ that same evening. The Apostle Paul requested prayer from the Ephesian churches. He wrote, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert. Be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words that I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan, that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should.
Good. It can be hard for us to understand how people could see Lazarus raised from the grave after four days. And their response is, we need to try and kill him again. Why religious leaders can see the obvious power of God, the miraculous work of God through our Lord Jesus. And still they rejected him. Content with their lives as they were, with their positions of power. We can also see the disciples. They're still in confusion at this stage. They don't know what's about to happen. But they know that they trust him and will follow him even into a dangerous place like Jerusalem. But most warming to my heart is to contemplate Mary. Such an emotional little one. He cries at Jesus, why didn't you come earlier to save my brother? And is filled with joy. Christ restores Lazarus back to life. And now she is prepared to just humbly sit at the Lord's feet. She did before listening to his teaching. Now she offers love and adoration as she pours her most expensive item out on his feet and wipes them with her own hair. She is a great example to us to start our life in Christ with humble adoration of our Master, our Saviour, our Lord and our friend. Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, the reality is that our hearts are often cold. The message of the teaching of your Son and his great works, even uh, the message of the cross, often leave us unmoved. And yet, Heavenly Father, you continue to guide us and lead us. Your spirit works through your word. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we see the good responses, those who grow in their love for you, those who follow you into danger, and those who humbly just sit at your feet, listening to you and ready to serve at anything, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to be those who come to you not for things we want, simply to adore you, to respect you, to love you, and to listen to you. We pray that you'll continue to bless us. And through us, Heavenly Father, we pray for those members of our family and our friends who do not know you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give us good opportunities to speak openly about why we love you, trust you, and believe in you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that through us you would shake the gates of hell and establish your church here on earth. These things we pray in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Jesus I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love. Hold me close, let your love surround me. Bring me near, draw me to your side. And as I wait, I rise up like an eagle, and I will sow with you. Your spirit leads me on in the power of your love. of your love as you live in me. Lord, renew my mind as your will unfolds my life in living every day. your love surround me, bring me near, draw me to your side, and as I wait, I rise up like the eagle, and I will sow with you, your spirit leads me on, in the power of your love. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. There are refreshments available in the hall.